The NBA draft continues to inch closer, and we're beginning to get an idea of how the board is shaping out. As there's plenty of rumors of the Sixers shopping this pick and looking to make a trade, the more and more I think about it, the more and more I sleep on it, I would prefer the Sixers make a selection and add some young talent to this roster, especially when you factor in looking at how important it is to have young players playing real minutes. When you look at some of these playoff teams, the Pacers, guy like Ben Shepard, who's making an impact, who is a guy on a rookie contract, incredibly just salary cap friendly for a team, and it's cool to watch what these guys can grow into and perhaps carry a heavier load moving forward. But for the Sixers team, I do want to talk about a potential guy who might fit that category, that being Isaiah Collier. And the reason that I bring this up is I did check the latest mock draft right here on NBADraft.com, and it has right there the 16th pick with the Sixers snagging Isaiah Collier. Now, this is a guy that I have not touched on yet, and I do think is an interesting conversation to have, that I do think he's a little bit more one of the boomer bust prospects in this draft. And to dive into a little bit of the scouting report, this from Jonathan Wasserman here, that uh, my fault, these are the stats. And looking at the full scouting report that coming from USC, he's 19 years old. He is a point guard, six foot five, 210 pounds. And he, Wasserman writes that, quote, after first impressions, Isaiah Collier looked like one of the favorites to go first in the 2024 NBA draft. He popped with his standout physical traits and on-ball excitement. Questions eventually emerged over his efficiency and USC losses before a hand injury sent him to the sidelines. But Collier started to turn things around upon his return, showing improvement in key areas while remaining productive. Few prospects in this draft have flashed both Collier's level of star potential and concerns. So I think that's a pretty spot on way to assess him there. I'll start by saying that this USC team this year made it tough to truly evaluate guys. That I did catch a handful of USC games this year. I will say I was not overly impressed with Isaiah Collier. And frankly, looking back at the box scores and some of the stats in preparation for this, I do think I did happen to catch some of his worst games, which that is the roll of the dice. It is what it is. Um, but the bottom line is that there certainly were the low point performances. The biggest thing that's going to stand out with with Isaiah Collier, number one, it is the athleticism and physicality. That he reminds me a lot of Jaden Ivey. That's the number one player comp that I get. And obviously, we don't know what Jaden Ivey is fully turning into as a player yet. But the other part that I'll say is it feels a little bit like year one Jaden Ivey. That season at Purdue in which he did not take that stride forward as a shooter. Still had some concerns with his processing and decision making. And that's my the forefront of my concern for Collier. So to dive into some stats for what he produced this year. On that USC team in 27 games that he averaged 16.3 points, 4.3 assists, 2.9 rebounds, 1.5 steals per game, shot 49% from the field, but just 33.8% from beyond the three-point arc on three attempts per game. And perhaps even more concerning, 67.3% at the free throw line, and that being getting to the line 5.8 attempts per game. And at the rate that he attacks, the relentless downhill nature and the way that he goes to the basket, he's going to be getting to the free throw line quite a bit, so you have to make sure to capitalize on that. You have to make sure that as a professional basketball player, the free throw lines are an advantage in your favor, that you're punishing teams by getting to that spot, not the other way around. And I do think ultimately that will be something that translates with Collier, that he will improve in that. In general, every player gets better as a shooter when they get to the NBA, for the most part, unless you're pulling a Ben Simmons, that the amount of time you're actually around basketball, playing basketball, being expected to hit all these shots, like you, it just naturally happens in that progression. I think Collier will fit into that category more so than anything. But to dive into some of the specifics, I do want to look at some strengths and weaknesses here. Once again, this from Jonathan Wasserman's article, and he writes the number one strength would be physicality. Collier uses his strength routinely, and even at the NBA level, it should give him an advantage attacking the rim. He won't be able to rely on it as much, but it will be a signature aspect of his dribble drive game and finishing package. Second, creating offense. Regardless of how his shot develops, it won't affect Collier's signature ability to make things happen with the ball. He puts pressure on defenses in transition and off-ball screens. And even when isolated against a defender who sags, Collier has the ability to shake or blow by. He also praises his playmaking potential, saying Collier's elusiveness, gravity, and passing skill create playmaking potential. The highlight tape was more convincing than his assist to turnover numbers. When focused on quarterbacking and offense, he can really set the table with enough vision and set up to feel for set up field to play point guard full time. 
I will say I think uh, Wasserman's a little bit stronger and more optimistic for him as a point guard than I truly feel. That I don't get the the, the natural sense that Collier is built to be a pass first guy. I just don't think he is, and that's not a full issue. That obviously every player has their strengths and weaknesses, and I think the number one strength for Isaiah Collier is that when he's in attack mode, he's incredibly talented. That this is a guy that from day one will be an elite level elite level athlete at the NBA level in comparison to other NBA players. That truly. The way that his kind of quick twitch, the way he can kind of snake through screens and his finishing package around the basket is very impressive as well. That is all stuff I'm confident in. Some of my personal concerns, and I'm about to touch on the weaknesses that he writes about, I do think that there is some role concern, whether he is a traditional point guard, whether he is a combo guard. I'm really, I think, the more I talk myself through it, far lower on the playmaking potential than these articles are making him seem. That, yes, you can see it in spurts, particularly in transition. I thought he made the game easier. He strikes me as a guy that, you know, playing with a quick tempo is definitely at his best. But what the concern with that is when playing him in a role, you know, you have to find ways to build out the rest of the necessary factors here. So when you are shorthanded in other areas, you have to have guys that can make up for it. And particularly when bringing up the Sixers team, it feels a little bit similar to the the standard with Tyrese Maxey, who Maxey obviously has gotten leaps and net bounds better as a playmaker, but is always going to be a score first guy. There is a fair concern to say pairing them, then you're just lacking enough playmaking. But I do think that the top end talent may still be worth taking a swing at 16. Now to dive into the weaknesses that Wasser writes about here he writes number one the shooting only three three three-point attempts per game at 33.8 percent three-point percentage and 67.3 percent free throw percentage has raised questions about collier's early nba shooting the eye test wasn't any more assuring as he gets a a little elevatory on a shot that's mostly all arms Given how effective he is at attacking the rim, NBA defense are going to have a clear game plan to sag and bait Collier into taking outside shots. And the second part he writes about is the decision making. While he showed improvement later, Collier was vulnerable all season to making careless or forced plays. He showed tunnel vision or drove the ball into traffic. He struggled to balance shot hunting with playmaking, raising questions about his trustworthiness for running an NBA offense anytime soon. And that is where I'm at. But kind of my mindset from the Sixers perspective and why this is still interesting to me is no matter what, pretty much you have to understand that the guy you're taking with the 16th overall pick is likely not going to be a guy who is going to be playing major minutes in a playoff rotation, that this is a pick for the future. So you still have to be locked in on improving the team through free agency, bringing in win-now players, or trading draft picks for win-now players. I'm more of the mindset where you pick a guy, see what he can turn into, and I still think there will be opportunities throughout the flow, the ebbs and flows of an 82-game season. I mean, we've seen some of these guys that have suited up and caught fire. Ricky Council the fourth, a perfect example last year who just stayed hungry who waited his opportunity ultimately got it made the most of it and turned that into a full NBA contract I think Isaiah Collier from day one will be more ready than Ricky Council the fourth looked and honestly they have a little bit of a similar just bulldogish nature in the way that they approach basketball that high level effort high level passion high level athleticism and energy that I'd see in both of these guys and with Collier specifically This is a dude who was getting some borderline number one pick buzz going into the air. And I do think that the situation in USC brought out some of his biggest weaknesses, particularly the playmaking. The offense as a whole was not very creative, and there was a lot of repetition in it. And there just were some issues as a whole, to the point where the USC coach had resigned following the year. I know there's been plenty of coverage with the Bronny James issue, or with Bronny James being a part of the team over there. But this team underperformed in a major way. That They finished the season below 500, did not qualify for the NCAA tournament, and, and entering the season, the expectation was that they would be a borderline NCAA tournament champion contender. And that might be a little strong, but they certainly were viewed as a team that were expected to make it into the tournament and make a little bit of noise. I think there's a lot of reasons why things went wrong, and I don't think Isaiah Collier is fully to blame for a lot of that. In fact, I think I'm more of the mindset that the situation being bad did not allow him to play his best basketball to an extent, that he's a guy that I would place the bet here that he's going to play better basketball at the NBA level than he showed in college. And there's a number of guys that you can use in examples in which that was the case, but I do think the situation was not made to bring out the best of them. And you certainly can contrast that and throw it back and criticize that he was not able to raise the guys around him or raise the situation as a whole to show out in the way that his talent should command. I understand you can look at it that way as well, but I do feel like there were some real deal issues with that USC team, and they were a tough watch for me personally by the time the end of the season was getting around. So ultimately, the bet on Isaiah Collier is that the talent is there, that this guy 
has day one NBA athleticism. He's got real deal, six foot five NBA frame, quick twitch, can kind of cut through the lane, attack the rim at a, a high level, probably in the upper echelon of the NBA right away with some of the finishing moves that he does have, some of the ways that he can spin it off the glass. The shooting is going to be the number one swing skill, and I do understand the concerns with bringing in a borderline non-shooter, although I think that's a little unfair to throw him in that category. I know that they uh, that Wasserman mentioned in there that the shot doesn't pass the eye test. I kind of disagree with that, that I think the shot mostly looks legitimate. I don't think there's any mechanical tweaks that need to be made. Possibly the release a little bit lower than one would hope, that he does shoot it kind of a little bit around the shoulder, not quite like Tyrese Halliburton level. And I also will note that like he looks more comfortable of pull-off jumpers in my eyes, that the catch-and-shoot seem to be the one that he kind of struggles thinking about a little bit. That's natural for basketball players as well, that, you know, that tends to happen to guys that are especially ones that typically play ball dominant. So these are all kind of minor issues that I'm willing to overlook and believe in the talent level. So while I, why I, while I still have guys like Devin Carter a little bit ahead in my book or in my mind for my draft board here, I would not mind if the Sixers are on the clock and some of the top options are taken that you take a swing for the fences with Isaiah Collier. I do believe that he presents or has the top end talent level that is worth taking a swing on. And ultimately, we'll see what happens from there. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Drop your thoughts on Isaiah Collier as a whole. Is that a guy you would like to see sporting the red, white, and blue right here in Philadelphia? Is that a guy that you think is worth passing up on or you would rather trade the pick for that? Let me know your, your thoughts. Make sure you are dropping a like on this video to let me know you're listening. Drop your thoughts below and smash that subscribe button to keep us growing over here at Sixers Digest. Appreciate each and every one of you guys for tuning into this video here. We'll be back with some more draft content and everything else that's churning out in the Sixers world throughout the rest of the offseason. Peace.